right. Welcome, everybody. We are really excited about our program today. We also are uh, Zooming live and alumni that may have sit in your seats uh, a couple years or many years earlier are on the uh, Zoom call as well. So we welcome our DePaul alumni community to join this McDermott Speaker Series event. We're happy to have you as well. I will just do a little housekeeping. Uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, to, at the end after our speaker have, is ready. And I will be, because we have uh, alums on the Zoom call, I will make sure if you raise your hand, let me run over to you and say your question on the uh, speaker so that our alumni can hear as well. If they have questions, they're going to also let Anna know. And she will uh, uh, pose those questions. Uh, but we're really super excited. Uh, the next event, which uh, Sandy, I want to make sure is Monday, right? We, we're sneaking in another event. So make sure that you see Sandy's email coming. We had uh, a speaker that was to be determined and we, uh, Sandy just nailed it, I think yesterday. So uh, it may look like something you weren't expecting, but Monday during the lunch period, look for that coming this week. We're excited about that. Uh, David Blackburn will be speaking and he is the, uh, the National Scout for the Baltimore Ravens. So the sports management group will be, talk, will be meeting with them as well. But today we're excited because we're going to hear from our alum and uh, she's traveled in. It's, uh, one of our first speakers coming from out of town and flying in since we could do that again. So we're really excited to have her here on campus. And a lot of you have uh, spoke to her this morning. Uh, but uh, first I'm going to uh, welcome Paige San Filippo, our uh, co-sponsor is Women in Economics and Business, and she is the president of Web, Web, well, also known as Web, and she's also the captain of the golf team and a management fellow, and she's going to introduce our speaker. So let's give a hand for Paige. Thank you so much, Steve, for that introduction. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to present Laura Chu. Um, she's a 1998 graduate. Um, she is currently um, the US Immunology Strategy and Operations Lead at Bristol Myers Squibb. In this role, she works directly with the business unit head and the US Immunology Matrix Leadership to build a best in class US immunology franchise. In addition to her day-to-day -day responsibilities, she's also the co-lead of BMS Pan Asian Network, which is a resource group and active as a member and sponsor for up and coming talent within the organization. Laura grew up in Greenfield, Indiana. While at DePauw, she served as the president of Kappa Alpha Theta, was a varsity cheerleader, a rector scholar, management fellow, and a member of Phi Beta Kappa. After graduation, as Steve mentioned, she moved to New York City and has recently made the move out to the suburbs in Princefield, New Jersey with her husband and two sons. So everyone, please welcome Laura. Well, that is a long walk. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Paige. And thank you to Steve Fauti and to Sandy for inviting me to come and speak to you today. It's really a privilege. I haven't been on campus in a really long time. Um, I moved to the East Coast and I don't really get back that much. So it's really nice to be on campus. It looks totally different. Uh, I also want to shout out Tom Fagan if he's on the alumni line. Tom Fagan was a friend of mine. We were management fellows together when we were here and he dug me up on LinkedIn and he connected with me and said, why don't you ever go back to DePauw? And I was like, I, I don't know. There's actually really no reason for that. So he um, tried to get me back earlier in the year and then we had some scheduling issues. So here I am. So thank you so much. I have a little bit of a tongue in cheek presentation for you today. It's called How My Liberal Arts Education Got Me Out of Grad School and Into My Life. And I named it such because I think there's a lot of value in the things that you're doing right now at DePauw that I only know because of hindsight that only I have that perspective of because I'm older now and I used to sit in that seat and I think about that sometimes um, about how when I was here, 
I worried a lot about making the right decision. I worried a lot about whether the choices that I was making were ultimately gonna be something that would lead me to what was quote unquote, a successful life. Um, and I thought about that a good deal instead of kind of just enjoying what I was doing daily in my liberal arts education. So I wanna talk a little bit about that today and how really the things that I learned at DePa helped propel me from a person in my life who was really focused on performance and evolve into a person who was more focused on engagement with other people and then into a life that hopefully one day I can look back and say had impact, right? Like that I did something that was meaningful, that the things that I do were things that people um, resonate with or felt meaningful or were important to someone. All right, so that's a little bit what I'm gonna focus on today. I mean, performance when I was growing up was everything that was prioritized, right? It was how much can you achieve? How hard can you work? How can you work outwork other people? Um, you know, like how high are you gonna stack those boxes, right? And then I got to Japa and I realized there's a whole bunch of people out there who also wanna stack boxes really high. And you have to think about what it means when you're around those people and how you're gonna engage with them. Um, and that's where the liberal arts education I think is really key. It's not necessarily about teaching you how to stack boxes higher or faster than other people. It's about giving you information that will help you be creative um, and stay curious, be really quick thinking so that you can make decisions, right? So you may not understand, but like when you go through Greek rush, that's basically practicing for many interviews. Or when you ride little five, it's basically understanding how to be on a team with a bunch of people that you may or may not have known and really about how you can push yourself beyond what your limits are. Or if you're deciding between creative writing or sociology or whatever, and you're like, how am I gonna get a job doing those things? You will, because those are things that help you understand human behavior and how to communicate with other people. And that is really, for me, the crux of what a liberal arts education did. It kind of got me out of this silo of thinking about all the things I could achieve. And it helped me understand that I had a bunch of data that that data could help me with decision-making. It helped me understand why people tick um, all those human behaviors, all those things that happen because you're a human being. And it helped me translate all of those things into what currently for me today is a really fun, interesting career. So we can talk more about that, but I'll tell you a little bit about how I got where I am today. All right, so I grew up in Greenfield, right? Um, and it's just east on 70 here. I took that drive today, except 70 has a lot of construction. So I just take 465. <laughs> boring details. My parents immigrated here from Taiwan. Um, so they came to University of Illinois in the late 70s to do their PhD work. And my dad got a job right out of grad school at Eli Lilly. So that's how I got to Greenfield, which at the time in the late 70s, early 80s, basically made my house the Chinatown of Indiana. Like there were no other Asian people. Um, and even as I grew up, especially I think as I grew up in that time frame, there were there was a lot of bias. Um, some of it was racist, some of it was um, benign, but there were a lot of biases and a lot of microaggressions, things that I dealt with that I didn't quite understand until recently how they've shaped me as I've been growing up. Once my mom and I were in Kroger and this woman came up to me, uh, to both of us and said, excuse me, are you Spanish? And we were like, what? And she was like, well, and she explained herself, she was like, like, I basically know that you're not black, but I also know that you're not white. So I'm just asking, are you Spanish, right? And I think it was like this moment where I thought to myself, man, I, what, what's happening right now? And I think for me, all it did was made me wanna hide, right? Because when you're in the second grade, you're not trying to be a superstar, you just wanna fit in. Like I have a second grader right now. He just wants to be included. He wants to make sure he got a Valentine from everyone. He gets to go to the birthday party. He just wants to fly under the radar and be included, right? And I think maybe for all kids, that's what it is. You just don't wanna be left out. And I think for my parents, it must've been really isolating at the time. But what that translated into then is that my brother and I always knew that no matter what, we were not going to fit in. So we were gonna be different. We were gonna stand out. And so if we were gonna stand out, then we were gonna stand out because we achieved more and we did more. We built those box towers higher, faster, stronger, 
better than everyone else. So if we were gonna be a sore thumb somewhere, we were gonna be the sore thumb that achieved and accomplished, right? So what does that look like? So we had to get 100% on everything, right? We not only had to do our homework to an A plus status, my mom gave us homework, like she was really, really intense. She got her own teacher's workbooks and like gave us homework. And then she gave us Chinese homework too. So we had to do all of that stuff until I was 18. At any given moment, we had to do everything that built our resume. So it was like, how much are you volunteering? How many extracurriculars were you doing? Everything was in service of what our reputation was. And from that reputation, how does that translate into your resume and into your transcript? And like, how is that gonna propel you forward in your life? There was a lot of pressure in that, you know? And like the success was really largely defined for my parents as financial security, which is something neither of them had growing up um, and certainly didn't feel in the US as immigrants. Um, and I think maybe that was something that was really pounded into me growing up, that financial success is the measure of achievement. And I don't know that I feel like that's true. I mean, I think those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. I think you can enjoy your life. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, I played um, piano and I was student council president and I was cheerleading captain and I was in drama club and I sang in three choirs. I was doing all the things that you're supposed to do, right? Check the box, check the box, check the box. And so it was time to go to college and I came to DePauw and that's what I did. I came to DePauw and I tried to outperform everybody. I was a rector scholar, I was a management fellow, I was varsity cheerleading captain, I was a theta my freshman year, I was in Century Singers. Okay, yeah, that is Alan Hill. Do you see that on the far left? That's Alan Hill, which shocked me because he came into the McDermott Center this morning and he had boxes of donuts and he was handing them to everyone and everyone's wearing a mask. And he introduced himself and I was like, oh my God. So at Old Gold one year, I won some kind of raffle and in that raffle, I got to change places with Alan Hill, who was Dean of Students for a day. So I was president of FEDA. So he had to go and be president of FEDA for a day. And then I had to sit in his office and like make decisions about things. And he gave me like projects to do. I, I don't actually remember what decisions I made, but that is Alan Hill. <laughs> so uh, I did all of those things, right? And when I got to DePauw, I actually had enough AP credits from high school. And like my mom had made me do all these like community um, college courses in the summer times, just as extra. I started off at DePauw with two and a half semesters worth of credits that I couldn't use because you have to take intros and stuff, but I had them. Like I could graduate, you know, and have like a deficit of two and a half credits if I wanted. Um, so I just like set forth and did all the things that I'd always thought that I was supposed to do which is achieve, perform, you know? Um, I made friends. I was in Longden on the first floor where we had our own bathroom, it was awesome. I don't know, maybe you guys all have your own bathrooms now. I have no idea, but at the time it was totally novel. I dated a very nice Vaisai. He took me to winter formal. He brought me flowers every week, right? Everything was on track. I did all the things, I met all the people. I did all the extra reading, right? So one day I was in one of my political science classes and my professor at the time gave us this kind of like bogus test. Um, the questions were about the syllabus and not about the content we had been discussing. Like legitimately the questions were, what was on page 15 of my syllabus? And the point he was trying to make was you have to pay attention to everything I tell you to, but it was pretty much a BS test, right? And I panicked because I'd studied really hard and I'd always gotten straight A's. And so I looked at this test and I was just like, this is not fair play. Like, I don't understand. And I just wrote, I don't know. Like, it was like a three question test and they were all about the syllabus. I just wrote, I don't know. And basically I got a C for being honest and everybody else who tried to write like some kind of like crazy response, they just failed. So this was like one of like three tests that we had for the whole year. So we all started with this like low average, right? And I was really mad. And when I got over sort of the devastation of getting a C on a BS test, I thought to myself, okay, well, this is interesting because I did okay and I didn't actually know the answer. I think that was like a real kind of aha moment for me where I was like, I can just be honest and not know the answers to things. I don't have to be performative in all the things that I do. I don't have to be right in all the things that I do. So I, I was okay. And I kind of took that perspective into other things 
that I did here at DePaul helped me open up a little bit. Um, I kept doing my curriculum, right? I was management fellow. So I did a lot of econ and other business related things. But then I decided that I also wanted to keep going with um, social sciences, sociology and psychology and political science. And I ended up being a political science major, right? And I, I loved learning about what made people tick and what human behaviors were all about. My parents were like, well, what are you gonna do with that? And so I just like thinking on my feet was like, I'll just go to law school. And everybody was satisfied with that answer. They were like, okay, law school is acceptable. That's fine. Law school is good. So then I, you know, did my semester abroad. I did my internship. I became president of Theta. Did all these extra things, and because I had all those credits from before, from high school, my senior year, all I had to do was my thesis. So I took things like beginning drawing, ballroom dancing. I took a class called jogging. Like we just jogged. <laughs> That's all we did. <laughs> I did Taekwondo, I did beginning folk guitar, right? Like I just padded my whole senior year with fun things that I wanted to do because I knew who I was supposed to be, but I couldn't really let go of the person that I wanted to be. I wanted to be this person, right? Like I wanted to do that. And I didn't necessarily want to go straight and do all of these other things because something else was starting to happen at this point after three or four years of just like always trying to stack boxes. I felt kind of empty in the achievement at a certain point. I was doing all the things for other people. I did not really understand what I wanted to do for myself. And then it turned on me because not only was I not getting that fulfillment of having achieved something, it started to play on my self-esteem. Now when I didn't achieve something, so let's say I went for something and didn't get it, I started to feel really upset about it. Like it started to, to erode my self-confidence and my self-esteem. And I was deriving a lot of energy from not getting things as opposed to the things that I was doing. So I was reacting a lot in my life um, and judging myself, I think, against what other people's standards were instead of setting those standards for myself. So I got into Vanderbilt Law School because I told people that that's what I was doing. So I took the LSATs, I went in, I did all of that. And I was happy for like a second. And then I was depressed because I got waitlisted at Northwestern. It was like, just, I saw how crazy that was, right? Like really great opportunities were happening and I couldn't celebrate them because I guess maybe authentically, none of them were really my idea, you know? And so they didn't really matter to me one way or the other. Um, and so I just kept moving forward. I went to Nashville, I rented an apartment, I bought all my books. Um, and then the very nice advice I wanted to get married. And I like had a quarter life crisis. I just like woke up every morning for like two weeks and was like, what am I doing? I'm gonna be a Midwestern lawyer. I'm gonna marry this guy. Like, what, what am I doing? What am I doing? And so I did what I had learned to do at DePauw. I looked at all of the facts. I looked at all of the data. I like assessed where I was. I asked myself what my priorities were. I was like, what did you want to do when you were five? What did you want to do when you were 10? What were the things that made you change your mind about any of those things? So I decided I need to do something else. Um, so I'm going to give you a disclaimer here. <laughs> Don't tell your parents that I told you this is what you're supposed to do. You're not. You should do whatever you want to do. I'm just going to tell you what I did. OK, that's my disclaimer. I deferred Vanderbilt without telling anybody. <laughs> I moved to New York. Uh, I asked the Phi side to please not follow me. I decided I was going to be an actress. Um, <laughs> I had DePaul connections before I went. It was a risk-based decision. I got some interviews with an executive um, at Deutsche Bank. I, re, you know, like I interviewed with him. He wanted me for an iBanking program, for the analyst program. They were on a hiring freeze. He asked me to hang out for a little bit. He took my resume home with him. His wife saw it. His wife called me and said, would you consider being our nanny? So I stopped and I asked myself, what are my priorities? Like, what am I trying to do here? Let's look at all the data. Let's put it out. What am I trying to accomplish right now? My goal is to get to New York. That's my goal. So I said, okay. And I moved in with them uh, to their penthouse apartment on Park Avenue. Um, and I will say that one thing that happened for me that I did not expect 
in all of this sort of chaos and mess that I created <laughs> for everybody um, was that when I landed at JFK, I had two suitcases and I had my beginning folk guitar guitar with me. That was it. I didn't know anybody. And these people were going to come and pick me up and take me to their house that I'd never seen. But I landed in New York. I looked out the window. I'd been to New York before, but I hadn't like lived in New York and I wasn't by myself in New York before. And I just really felt like I could breathe for the first time. And I hope that you feel that at some point in your life, because that is an amazing feeling. Just like I was like, right now in this moment, I'm the most best version of Laura that I'm ever going to be. Like, this is me. This is where I am. This is what I want to do. And I will make a million mistakes and it will be messy. But I love this. Like, I'm here. I'm here for this. I'm doing this. Right. So these people had two daughters. They were seven and 11. Like, I don't know about you. I started babysitting when I was 11. I certainly did not have a live in nanny. Uh, they went to like a fancy private school on the Upper East Side. I walked them to school um, and then I would pick them up after school and take them to activities. And during the day, if I got bored, um, they would hook me up. These people would hook me up with their hedge fund friends. And then I would like do like a little bit of a side hustle in finance for the hedge fund because I had those skills that I learned from DePa, right? And when I got motivated, I took a picture, this picture, the black and white, my sorority sister took that on the front steps of Theta. She took it for a photography class. I just made it into a headshot. And I was like, I'm gonna to start to audition. This is what I came here to do. I have a place to live. People are paying me. I'm gonna do that. And I did a million tiny student films. I did off, 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 off Broadway. I did all that stuff. And then I started to make some money at it. And I started to be a little more able to support myself from some of these finance jobs. Um, so I left the penthouse because it is really crazy to live with very, very rich people. Um, I will just say that I have a nanny diary story if any of you have one-on-ones with me later. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to live the life that I wanted to lead. But I, I wasn't really ready to just go fully into that. So I got a job at a dot-com. There were a lot of dot-coms just booming at the time. I got a job in a venture capital-backed telecom company. I liked the people that I worked with. And the lesson that I learned about being honest was that I said to them, I'm also auditioning sometimes and trying to act. There will be times when I'm gonna hop out and go to an audition. And you know what I learned? I learned that if you do the work and you have the reputation, so you have to do the performance piece, like people have to know that you're good for the work. But when you do that, you can be honest and you can just kind of make up your own job as long as you get the work done. People don't care. They appreciate the honesty, right? You have to do the work though. Like the reputation has to precede you. You have to be honest about your intentions. They were really supportive. And I learned too that it's just as important um, what you say as much as how you say it. So that to me was something that I was really learning at that time. Here's what I learned from auditioning. I learned that you don't always get things when you audition. I mean, this is no duh, right? Um, it's all about all the times you don't get a job. But what I learned about that is that it doesn't mean you're not good enough, right? Like it completely redefined what failure is for me. You don't fail. Failure is always an option. You just weren't right for the job. That helped me kind of get out of my own head about the times when I wasn't able to achieve things. Sometimes it just doesn't break your way. That's the truth. You learn that in sports, you learn that in a lot of things. Some things hurt more than others. It's not always about you. I learned that from um, auditioning. That started to shape a little bit about who I am, right? Um, I worked crazy hours, you know? I didn't have a family, I didn't have, yeah, I, just, I worked 16, 17 hours a day. Some days we sat on boxes because we had no money. Some days, like I was signing for like $25,000 worth of alcohol that was being delivered to the CEO's loft because we just got some investments and we were gonna have a huge party. You know, like every day was a little bit different. I started to fly back and forth between New York and LA to audition for movies and pilot seasons. Um, a show that I was in got upgraded to Off-Broadway. So I got my, actor, my actor's equity card. That's the... Um, that is the union for theater actors. And then um, I did a bunch of law and orders and stuff. And um, I got, that's the middle picture. That's one of my law and orders that still plays. Um, I get a residual check for like approximately $11 every time it comes up. <laughs> After taxes, it's like like six and change. Um, and I got my SAG card, um, you know? So it was, it was a fun time in my life. 
where I'm gonna pause right now is to say to you, I made some bold decisions in my life. I'm not suggesting that bold decisions are things that you have to do, right? I made bold decisions, but I didn't make crazy decisions. I took calculated risks. I looked at the data. I looked at what was available. I leaned into what was gonna make me happy, right? And these decisions that I started to make were now based on context. So it was like, oh, what's the scenario? What's the situation here? Um, the decisions I made were based on critical thinking, all of the data, as I'm saying to you, things that you're doing today here in school. Um, the decisions were based on my ability to be honest with myself about what I wanted and to be brave enough to stand up for the things that I wanted. And the more decisions that I made, the more experience I got. And the more experience I got, the more of a voice I developed. And the more of a voice I developed, the more of my voice I developed, right? And so this is the part about really being able to move or transition from a life that's based on performance to a life that's um, more firmly centered on engagement with other people. I will say that sometimes I don't really remember a lot of what I did before I was 25. And it wasn't because I was you know, in a haze or anything. It's because I didn't make any decisions for myself really before I was 25. And I don't know if 25 is a magic number for whatever reason. It might be because I was in New York for a couple of years and just kind of like getting through and churning through all that. But for whatever it is, 25 is the age where I really start remembering things. Um, I remember the decisions I make. I remember that I stood up for myself starting then, right? And at 25 is when I started to find my tribe. So some of these people were people from before. The one on the right, the blonde, she's a sorority sister of mine um, from Theta. She's still my best friend to this day. Um, I moved to Brooklyn because that was part of what everybody was doing. Although I moved to Brooklyn before Brooklyn was Brooklyn. And I had this like tiny three bedroom apartment that I shared with my friends. We had two bathrooms and we had a washer and dryer, which is like unheard of in New York City. Everybody was very envious. Uh, I started to do more and more with the venture capital job. I met a guy at the company that I worked for. He was living in LA. I started to go to LA more. I was auditioning and working and spending time with him. Things were starting to hum because I was like awake. I was paying attention with what was going on in my life for the first time. I was like really engaging with people because all my choices and my conversations were about things that I liked, right? Um, I got promoted. I started to lead a team of people. I worked through the integration of like nine mergers and acquisitions with this um, venture capital telecom company before I was 26. I got tons of work experience um, and I made lots of bad decisions in a small setting and it's okay. Like that's what happens, you know? I learned what it means to lead people. And I learned that when you're a leader of a team, they're looking for you for help. And you have to kind of decide how much is too much help and how much you can let somebody like fail safely and, and do those things. I started to learn those things. Um, my roommates moved out. The guy I met moved in, into the apartment with the washer and dryer. We got married, you know? Uh, my maid of honor was Maggie with the blonde hair in her toast, and I'd never really thought of it, she also commented on how she always looked at me as a person who made courageous decisions, but she would never call any of my behavior risky, right? And I really loved that about her, that she'd been watching me over the years and, and got that, understood that. She was still along for the ride with me as I you know, kind of like tried to unpack my crazy life. Um, our company that I was working for went through another merger, and this time we were on the acquisition end of it. And I was just tired. The whole culture of the company changed. I was exhausted. I couldn't really remember why we were stacking these boxes anymore. Um, I activated my network. I asked myself what my priorities were. I started talking to people. And um, a woman that I worked with said, you should work in pharma. Now, I had resisted pharma my whole life. My parents worked at Lilly. I was not going to work at Lilly. I was not going to be in pharma. And I was like, oh, OK. Maybe, and I became a sales rep for Takeda. Um, so I joined Takeda, and then I realized that I really loved the culture at Takeda, and I realized I really fell in love with the work that we do in pharma. I mean, really, you don't have another job, in my opinion, that gets you closer to how you can really change somebody's life in the blink of an eye with a medicine that saves their lives. And especially when I was working in oncology, that was, um, that was an amazing experience for me. 
I was still a person though, who was living two lives, right? Like, so I still auditioned a little bit. I still did movies. I still did voiceover work. Um, and I had to ask myself at a certain point, well, what are my priorities? Is this still what I want to do? Because I really still loved acting, but it's like two full-time jobs to manage all of that. Plus, try to launch a professional career. And part of what I realized was what I was trying to accomplish with acting to some extent was to fill in that gap of that sort of high of all the things that you achieve and you feel really good about it. At least in that moment, that was the realization that I had. I still love acting, but I was looking for instant gratification in a moment where there were, so I was looking for junk food when I should have been eating like good food, right? Like healthy food. And the healthy food for me at that moment was to keep working on skills that were gonna make me better from a personal and professional standpoint. So I left Takeda, I joined Bristol Myers Squibb where I am today, 10 years ago, um, because there were more career opportunities for me on the East Coast. So, um, you know, Chicago was where Takeda was then, now they're in Boston, but there's still, you know, pharma all over the place. And at BMS, I could move really quickly because I could go in house. So I became a sales trainer in the oncology division. And because of my oncology experience, I was asked to help lead a launch of a new major oncology product when it came up. So that was awesome. And because I was in house, I started to meet a lot of people and my network was broadened and my experiences were broadened. Um, I learned more than I really ever thought I could doing a lot of little tiny like grunt work things, right? But you met a lot of people and you built your network out. And then I started to find that there were people within this organization who wanted to invest in me. So third taco on the right is um, one of the best managers that I've ever had. And he really sat me down and said, it's easy to be led in your career, meaning like someone will want to promote you and then you'll get promoted to this other thing. And then you can just keep doing that, but you're going to get stuck at a certain point because you never actually chose any of the things that you did. You just did it because someone asked you to do it. That really resonated with me. This idea that you can make your own path if you spend the time to think about what it is that you want. Um, so he helped me. He helped me understand what jobs are available. He helped me understand what a well-rounded career looks like. He helped me understand that I can do whatever I want to do and I can just make it up as I go along if I want to, right? And so this became my priority. Um, I was commuting from Brooklyn to Princeton every day. It's like an hour and change each way. Um, but really, I don't, you don't have tolls as much in Indiana. It was like $25 in tolls a day. It was crazy. So as a result, my husband and I decided that we were going to make the decision to move out of New York. I mean, at that point, I had two little kids. Um, my little guy was sleeping in a pack and play in our living room because that's Brooklyn living. You know, we had a thousand square feet in one bathroom, four of us. Um, and so we decided that for our family, we were going to move to Princeton. And when I got there and I was closer to work and my kids could have like a normal, like go to after school things and sports and stuff kind of life, instead of being on a commute with me all day. Um, that's when I started to realize that these things that I was prioritizing, all the things that I was doing, I was having impact, um, on them. Right. And like the decisions that I was making were no longer just for me anymore. They were decisions that I was making for other people, for my family. So impact was something that started to become really important to me at that point. And the move was a big decision we made as a family so that we could increase the impact that we had in general. For me at work um, with our kids so that they could have a life with like a yard and stuff. You know, my older son, when we bought the house, asked me if the house came with a parking spot. I mean, like, this is what Brooklyn kids ask, you know? He was like, does this house um, have a place for you to park? Because he was used to me driving around the block for like 40 minutes, trying to find a parking spot every day. Um, so I realized that uh, the quality of life that we were gonna have was gonna be much better. I was gonna be able to be more focused and not so crazy running around all the time. I realized that I hadn't really taken a sick day in five years because every time I took a sick day, kids didn't have daycare because they were going back and forth to daycare with me. So that was nice. I mean, I did cry when I turned in my New York City driver's license um, because it was like fully sinking in that I now lived in the suburbs. But I really enjoyed shopping with a grocery cart that you can just like put stuff in and like wheel it to your car and then put it and like it's, you know, you used to, I used to have to shop like daily in New York because you really can just buy what you can carry. <laughs> all of these random things that happen as you get older that you get excited about. Um, 
But I found that with all my extra newfound time, what it allowed me to do was think a little bit about what impact I was having also beyond my own life, my professional career, right? I started to choose things that would have impact in the world too. Um, I rode in this amazing event that BMS sponsors every year called Coast to Coast for Cancer. So teams of riders ride from Oregon to New Jersey. Um, I hadn't even been on a bike since high school and I'd never clipped in. I did not know what clipping in meant. Uh, not even in spin class, I never clipped in. So I learned how to clip in and I rode 300 miles in three days to raise money for cancer research. Um, you heard Paige say that I became the co-lead for PAN, which is the Pacific Asian Network at BMS. And after the shootings in Atlanta in March, 2021, we helped our members find their voices and speak up against Asian hate. And we brought Hollaback training to BMS so that people could understand what it meant to engage um, with other people and to ask questions um, and a place for people to sort of process all of the big feelings that they were having. A lot of my childhood stuff came up then. My career and my network and my responsibilities began to accelerate and I stopped being somebody who has to interview for jobs. I've started being a person that starts getting asked for jobs and I feel really blessed and like really grateful that that's sort of the reputation that I've built for myself, but it's not over yet, right? Like you have to keep doing those things. You still have to do the performance piece. You have to be the person that earns the trust, that earns the right. Um, you have to be the person who has the interpersonal skills to engage appropriately. And you have to be a person whose life means something more than what you do, like all the widgets that you make. So my boss today is the senior vice president of immunology. She runs a multi-billion dollar franchise for the US business um, at BMS. And I'm essentially her chief of staff, you know? She um, runs, she's been an amazing champion of me. She just kicks butt in her Valentino stilettos all day long. I help her run her leadership team, um, which is where political science and politics in general really come in handy. Um, I help her with her org structure. So making decisions about how many people we're gonna have where, which is where sociology is really helpful, industrial psych, super helpful in that situation. I help her build a culture um, of the people who join the organization and keep them motivated, right? And honestly, my parents make fun of me, but that's where being a cheerleader was super helpful to my career today. Just keeping people engaged and happy and like, you know, like psyched to come to work. Everything I did today, everything I do today is really informed by the experiences that I had here, like on campus, in person with other people, learning to read those cues, it was foundational to all of it. So I hope that you'll be able in your lives to evolve from a person who's really focused. I mean, it's so easy in college to be so focused on achievements and performance into a person who starts to engage with the world, into a person who makes impact into the world. So I will just leave you with one closing thought, things that I wish people had said to me when I was in college. The only person who knows what you want is you and what you want is not wrong. It may not be what someone else wants and it may not be the expectations that have been set, but only you know what you wanna do, that you should be nice. There's no point in doing what you want if you're gonna leave a wake of bodies behind you, right? Be nice, there's enough for everybody. All of it is enough, there's plenty, okay? And if you do things that matter to you, there are no wrong decisions. There's no wrong turn that you're gonna make. You're gonna learn from it all and you're gonna move forward with all of it. I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm here to answer questions if you have any questions. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got a, 10 minutes for questions. So anybody have a question? Da, da. Oh, here we go. Wait till I get back there. <laughs> say your name and your year. Hi, Laura. I'm Allison Harvey. I'm a senior. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us today. My question for you is how do you kind of bring that motivational aspect into your everyday life at work? Thank and you. And like bringing, sorry, bringing others along with you, I would say. Yeah, no, thanks, Allison, for the question. Um, you know, I think I'm just an optimist by nature. I think I, I'm a glass half full kind of person. I think the energy that you bring comes from whether or not you believe in what you're doing, right? It's really easy to be jaded. It's really easy um, to say, oh, this isn't working. I think some things that help propel and that other people see is when you try to be solution oriented. And I think when 
you reward intelligent failure, meaning that it's not the worst thing in the world if something that you try doesn't work. You know, I, I think giving people the space and the permission to feel that and to understand that all of those things are like failing upward, that I think is really important too. If you can set a culture in that way, then people will want to continue to work with you because it's not a drag, you know? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Yep. Hi, Laura, my name is Maylee Minnick. Um, I'm a junior management fellow. And I had a question about um, how you previously said you took calculated risks, but your one friend who was in your wedding thought you were courageous versus risky. And so I was curious if you could like define in your words what the difference between being courageous or risky or taking calculated risks means to you. Thank you, Maylee. Um, I don't know if I know what a good answer is to that, right? I think courageous or courage for me is being true to yourself. So if there is a, a truth about you that you know, it's internalized. You just really have to be quiet enough to hear it. I mean, that stuff exists in you. It's ancient. You know, it's like in you. Um, the courage to do something that someone else didn't plan for you or to go off track a little bit to explore what that truth is for you, I think, for me is what courage is. Calculated risks are, how do you get there without blowing it all up, right? Like, what are the things that you can do? So I'll give you an example. I had tons of friends that like were wait with like waiters and waitresses and bartenders. That was just never going to be the thing that I could do. I was gonna to have too much anxiety figuring out if I could pay for my life and also do this other thing at the same time and I needed space and time. I had another set of skills. I could like crunch numbers and build you know, pivot tables for hedge fund people. So I did that instead. I think a calculated risk for me was I did that kind of stuff part-time. It was steady. It satisfied the anxiety that I felt about like completely blowing the whole thing up but still gave me some freedom to do other things. I don't know what that balance is for everyone. I think sometimes I veer on the um, cusp of being too risk averse versus really going for it. And I think that changes given your circumstances. I can't do crazy stuff as much anymore. I have these little kids that I have to pay for too and keep alive, you know? So like that is for me where the calculation of the risk changes based on what your context is. But the courage comes from continually evaluating for yourself if you're happy in what you're doing. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Great. 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 Great question. Hi, Laura. No. Oh, hi, Laura. Um, this question is actually from me. Um, Anna Wachowski, class of 2019. Um, how did you stop placing your self value in the praise and approval of others, especially your parents? Oh man. Well, I mean, let me call my therapist and we can talk about that. Um, it's really hard, right? Because you grow up and there's this set of rules that someone else has made and it's all with good intent. It is because that's how their blueprint was, or that's what they aspired for their blueprint to be. And like, all you want to do is make sure that a person can make it in the world based on whatever your defined success is, but really like, what is success other than a person feeling personally fulfilled? Um, and it means different things for other people. So like, do I think my parents are successful? I do, because they did what made them feel personally fulfilled. How did I break out of that? At some point you just have to grow up, right? Like at some point you just have to say to yourself, okay, so I did this and it's still not the blueprint that I want. I, I, I need to try something else. Really, it's like this itch isn't going to get scratched any other way than if I try this, right? And here's the thing. My parents supported and loved me throughout all of it. Were they disappointed? And did my mom constantly call me and ask me when I was going to grad school? She did. Um, and you manage that because you are being true to the thing that you have to do. So um, how do you manage the disappointment? I, you know, I don't know, I think maybe when it stops being, if it's not disappointing to you, who cares, right? You're not hurting anybody. You don't have to apologize for wanting to do things in your life. You're managing a set of expectations that you didn't even create. So the interpersonal skills and 
where you're learning to communicate with people, I think there are ways to articulate that um, where you can do that without a lot of damage. Does that answer your question? Hi, my name is Mia Davis. Um, I just have a question. Like when you moved up to New York, was there ever that self-doubt or like lack of confidence that you were going to make it? Or did you just kind of put your head down and try to get through that work? What was that process like? And was there ever like a time where you were like, I can't make it, you know, I need to go back to Vanderbilt and continue to go to law school. Like this isn't cut out for me. I made the wrong choice. Thank you, Mia. And um, she also left her boyfriend behind too, right? I know, that poor guy. I will tell you, I can't find him on any social media, which is just as well. Like I, I'm just like so curious, you know what I mean? I just, I feel so bad, but I'm sure he has a, he has a much better life now because I'm not in it. I mean, truly, truly. Um, I was a bit of a mess for a while. Um, did I ever have self-doubt? Sure, I still have self-doubt. Um, did I ever say I'm gonna move back? No. I got there and I was like, I'm here and I'm gonna do what I need to do. There is a piece, it's interesting what you ask because there was not self-doubt that I was gonna make it. And when I say make it, I don't mean like, you know, like um, auditioning or be a star or whatever. Like my, I didn't have, I don't, I didn't ever have, so I didn't let myself doubt those things. I was just gonna survive in New York. That was gonna be okay. Um, maybe that is a privileged point of view because I knew that I could come back. Right. So I don't know that everybody has that choice all the time, but I also know that I could have come back. I didn't want to, but I could have. Um, but I worked as if I didn't have that safety net. Somebody over here had a question earlier. I missed it. Maybe it got answered. Anybody else? Oh, there we go. Grace. <laughs> Hi, Grace Kinsey, a senior management fellow. A question kind of similar to Anna's, but it seems like you you have a really impressive resume. It seems like almost success and these things that people consider big accomplishments became expectations for you in college. And so kind of the shortcomings is where your focus went to, even with a long list of you know incredible accomplishments previously. When did your mindset change or is it something that you still have to fight to really focus on the things that you've done well, as opposed to only thinking about where we've fallen short. Thanks, Grace. Um, I, I still think about all the areas in which I fall short. I think that's just part of my hard wiring, right? What I don't let it do is discourage me from continuing to try. That's maybe where the flip, like the switch flipped. It was, um, I feel disappointment. I mean, disappointment is my kryptonite. I am, I used to be just paralyzed by disappointment. I think where maturity comes in and experience is that you're gonna be disappointed. I mean, it's just life, that's what it is. And sometimes the disappointment is good for you because it propels you in a different direction or gives you other perspective. So when I don't get something that I want, yeah, I still feel disappointed. I stopped feeling like it was because I was bad or wrong. I think that's different, right? It's very black and white when you're younger because your life experience suggests that that's how it goes. Like some people get it and some people don't get, get it or whatever. Some people are prom queen and some people are not. And I think that feels um, really definitive, but that's just not how it is when you run sort of like the long marathon of what your life is. So I'm not a superhero. I totally feel crushed in moments, but I also then say to myself, what did I get out of that experience? What Am I learning like, so what am I gonna do differently next time? And it does open your mind to a lot of options and possibilities and thinking that maybe didn't exist before when the only thing was to get into Northwestern or whatever it was. Got time, for probably two more questions. Okay, Michael. Hello there, my name is Michael. And uh, my question for you is, uh, you mentioned about several turning points in your life, in your career. And I was wondering what was, what would you consider as the toughest decision you have ever made? The toughest decision I've made in my career? Yes. Or and, in my life? Or you can talk about both if you want. <laughs> well, I mean, the toughest decision I made in my life was to just say peace and move to New York. I mean, that was really very, very, um, 
it was heart wrenching. I call it a quarter life crisis because I did feel like I was being pushed up this hill and I was resisting it at every moment. That's a really tough thing to do when you're 21, 22 years old, you know, also because you have no money, everything is financed by other things. Um, your decisions have consequences, right? And so you, there's a little bit of, of collateral damage that comes with making a decision like that. You need support uh, in order to make that decision. You need a lot of courage to be able to stand up for yourself that way. I think one of the toughest professional or career decisions that I've made are always around anything that has to do with impacting people, meaning when someone's gonna lose their role, right? And um, that's because there is a sometimes strategic or business need for it that you can cerebrally rationalize, but then you know at the end of the day that there's a piece of it that you have to execute where there's a person on the other end. A couple of examples of this that I think about are when the person's not the right fit for the role. And maybe part of what I'm explaining to you guys here is that that's not a failure. That's information that you have if you're the person on that receiving end, that that wasn't the right job for you, you know, like that you should try something else. Like maybe you were just heads down into eye banking and it was terrible, but you were like, this is what I'm doing because I'm going to do this, this, and this, right? And maybe they had to downsize for whatever reason. It's not personal. It's an opportunity. Um, I think about that and I try to do those things then when you have to make those decisions with as much dignity and as much grace as, as you can offer because we're human beings at the end of the day. That's impact. Like you can do that in a kind way without destroying somebody when you can help them. So those are like the toughest decisions are the ones that have actual people impact at the other end of it. Um, and hopefully, you know, those things are, are done with, with grace. Thanks, Michael. Wonderful. Well, that is time. Let's give Laura a wonderful applause. Thank you so much.